All right. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome, everyone, to the fifth and final episode of Systemic Justice's Reframing Climate Justice Speaker Series. My name is Sammy Glassingame, and I'm very happy to be with you as a moderator for this series and for this final episode. I want to welcome into this final webinar for the series, Salam and Denise, who are joining us um, from two different parts of Europe. Uh, and I just love to invite you in and ask you both to introduce yourselves in whichever way feels right and relevant for you. Um, and to share a bit about how you doing, how you're coming to this space today. Um, hello to you both. Denise, would you like to start us off? Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I am Denise, uh, and I am a climate justice activist from Italy. Uh, I'm doing very well today, and I am very excited about this session and happy to share the space with Sami and Salam. Um, and... Well, I'm a student. I study international cooperation in Milano, and that's pretty much everything I do. So activism and university. <laughs> nice. And you're based in Milano? Yes. Good. Welcome, Denise. Nice to have you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Salam, how are you? How are you coming to the space? Who are you? Hi. Hi, everyone. My name is Salam. And I'm a climate justice activist. I'm based in Denmark. Uh, I live in the countryside of Denmark, but I'm moving soon to Copenhagen. So soon I'll get the feel of living in the big city, doing activism there. Um, I study medicine, which is also why I'm moving. Uh, so I have like this kind of um, two-parted life where I do like um, life science and I do um, climate activism, activism. And maybe someday I'll be able to combine these two because there is a lot of interconnectedness between these two, but it's not something that I have um, explored yet. Um, I'm 19 years old. I don't know if I did mention that already. And I'm uh, 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 and I'm half Lebanese, half Palestinian. So that also like connects me to some issues in this world. Um, and yeah, I think that's all I do for now. Uh, I don't have a lot more time uh, to do other stuff nowadays. Nice. All right. Thank you. Thank you both uh, for being here. Um, as I mentioned, it is the fifth and final series of the speaker series. Um, and so if you're just joining us, I encourage you to go back and check out the first four episodes as well. Um, we have been talking about many, many, many things. Um, we started off by defining what climate justice actually is and what we're meant to be or intending to talk about in this series. We talked about the mindsets, particularly the colonial mindsets we need to be unlearning in order to move this work forward. Uh, we talked about spatial justice, migration rights and justice. Um, and in this episode, we are hoping to talk a bit about what it means to shape the future of Europe's movements for climate justice. Um, I myself is an organizer, am an organizer that's normally based in Berlin, um, but have been in the Pacific time zone for some time now, currently calling in from Colombia, Cali, Colombia. And so I just wanted to give a short shout out to the incredible organizers I've been breaking bread with here as well, because our fights for climate justice are global. Um, but the series is meant to highlight incredible organizers in Europe who are pushing that narrative further and helping people understand the necessity of a more intersectional, decolonial, anti-racist movement for climate justice in Europe. And so let's get into it. I am very excited to hear from you. And I think we should just start with, with your visions. I mean, you both are organizing in your different contexts and um, have also some, somewhat moved around maybe a little bit in the work that you're doing. And so I'm curious what your visions for climate justice are in Europe uh, versus kind of how you're seeing it now. Like how would you describe the movement as it currently stands and where do you hope to see it go to um, in the coming years? 
as Salam's drinks. Maybe, Denise, you want to start us off? Yeah, I can start. Um, so, um, I... I've been a climate organizer both in Italy and in Sweden because I lived in Stockholm for a year between 2021 and 2022. Um, and I think in Sweden, it's where I started to realize that uh, people are slowly starting to realize them to more and more what climate justice really means, what our fight really is about, the role that inter intersectionality plays, like we're not only fighting for climate change, but it's something wider, um, not only inside the grassroots movements, like people are starting to realize this, but also like outside this bubble. Um, and I feel like we've come a long way, but of course there is still a lot to do. Um, marginalized communities, have to be empowered and included in decision-making processes regarding climate policies um, where like environmental burdens are like not only carried on the shoulders of the most vulnerable population and where there's like um, an equitable access to resources, opportunities uh, for ad adaptation and mitigation. Um, I feel like currently um, there is a gap between the vision, between this vision that I just described and the reality on ground. Um, like while there have been uh, strides made in recognizing the importance of climate justice, uh, the implementation has often fallen short because uh, marginalized communities, uh, including indigenous people, migrants, low income individuals continue to face the burden of climate change uh, and its impacts and are often excluded from the policy making table. And I think that to bridge this gap, we need to consider like a stronger commitment from governments and institution uh, so that they can center for real uh, in their policies and practices. Um, like they can center for real um, what climate justice means and so that we can amplify the voices of the most affected by climate change to ensure their concerns are addressed for real. Thank you, Muse. So um, would you like to add to this or share more? Yeah, um, so when I think of climate justice, I believe that word as uh, a term can um, mean a mean different different things right um so it can um both be a set of values but also like a state of the world a world can be unjust a climately unjust and it can be climately just um so to know what these sort of things mean i be uh, i believe we need to have like a vision of what a climate just world is to be able to define these set of values um, and that's why my movement, at least, has been working with uh, like utopias and trying to like um, create a picture of the um, climate just world. Um, and central for that is um, the basically the downfall of capitalism. Um, in a sense, it's a it's a funny way to put it, and it's uh, but it's in a sense this sort of like um, a two parted um, vision of humility for nature and equity for people. Um, so we need to stop exploiting nature. Nature. We need to like be more humble with the way we treat it and stuff. Um, and uh, we need to, um, and, and therefore a requisite for that is uh, to stop exploitation of people because uh, when you stop exploiting nature, it, it's hard to find a use for an exploitation of people. Uh, and these two things are so interconnected uh, so to have a world where uh, we live in harmony with nature, where we um, don't stress ourselves, where we have like mentally and uh, mentally ha uh, healthy lives and um, like just healthy lives for us as people, for the nature and stuff. Um, a requisite for that is a social just world and humility for, humility for nature and stuff. So that is like a type of vision that we um, we, we see. Uh, which can be put more precise and more specific, but that's maybe for another time. Um, and so where we now, 
um, like right now we are in a world where we do exploit people a lot. Uh, we do exploit nature. That's like what the entire system of Europe is built up is built around. Like uh, people in Denmark, we live amazing lives. Like almost everybody have uh, like lots of wealth and houses and cars and all of these things, and it's amazing. But it's on the consequence of nature, and it's on the consequence of most of the people that aren't here uh, so that's not a sustainable solution for society uh, so we, there is a far way to go uh, to like achieve a climate just well definitely thank you for for shedding light on that and so i guess i'm curious about like about how you see how the movements are working at the moment like where are the energies going at the moment um and is it is there is there a difference towards where you feel like maybe they should be going um to move us closer to a more strengthened climate justice movement go ahead Salam. okay um so um trying to build a uh, to build this like clim global climate justice movement, right? Um, I think that it started out being a lot focused on like just CO2 emissions and having this like real narrow view. Uh, and at least I believe that most climate activists start this way because that's like what we start to learn about. And as we grow as individual climate activists and as we grow as a movement, we learn new stuff and we develop the movement uh, to explore this sort of interconnected interconnectedness of the movement. And um, I loved how, for example, with um, the genocide in Palestine, how the climate movement took it to themselves to um, support that, to, um, to, to like be in support because of the interconnectedness of the crisis. And I think that's a really positive uh, development of the movement. And I think that this is a not like this is not a fully developed um it, development yet um but but it is one right way that the movement is developing itself in and i think that as the climate crisis grows so does the movement because more people will see the crisis will learn about the crisis and will um feel the crisis uh, and so like the so this is sort of an advantage of the growing climate crisis um uh, if you can put it in that way it's yeah um but 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 this also brings barriers because as the climate crisis grows um so does harassment of um of of environmental defenders um i just read that like um what was it it like Okay, I don't remember the number, but like a lot of like there's climate defenders being killed, being harassed uh, in like big numbers, which is uh, which is a big barrier for, for, for the growth of the climate movement. Uh, so we have like this. We have also the part of uh, as the climate crisis grows. So like does the challenges of fixing it because it becomes hard and we will what if we reach the tipping points and we can't save it and all of these thoughts will become more and more uh, like relevant and so as this grows hopelessness will grow as well and if someone doesn't have hope for a uh, climate just future it'll probably be harder for them to to fight for one uh, mm -hmm. and that that'll probably be one of the big challenges of the climate movement as well in the future thank you so um, you moved us into barriers already, which I think is interesting, right? You've shared a bit about your visions. And what I heard was, um, if correct me if I'm wrong, but I, what, what I heard was the vision is a more interconnected understanding of like all these different topics that, that are necessary to think about simultaneously in order to understand and reach climate justice. Um, but barriers come up to that. Um, it, this hopelessness that you brought up is strong one. The resistance to seeing the interconnectedness of all these topics, particularly Palestine and some movements for climate justice in Europe right now, I think is definitely worth highlighting. 
Um, but Denise, what else is on your mind in terms of um, some barriers that maybe are standing in the way of us reaching a more strengthened climate justice movement? Um, uh, so, well, as Salam said, there definitely are barriers. And I feel like the most significant one is systemic inequality. Uh, that says nothing, but at the same time, it says everything. Um, systemic inequality, because like perpetuates the disparities uh, in access to resources, power, decision-making processes, and this inequality often marginalize communities that are most affected by the climate change. Uh, and like then they are not able to advocate for the rights and needs effectively. Um, and there's also like a resistance from other interests, especially like the one coming from the fossil fuel industries and economic elites, uh, who actually like prioritize a short-term profit over a long-term sustainability and justice. Uh, Fridays for Future, that is the movement I do my activism with. Um, a couple of years ago had this hashtag, which was people not profit. That was like a short sentence, but I feel like it says everything because um, it was like advocating for like climate justice by saying to the people in power, stop putting money before our own lives, before the life of the climate defenders, the frontline defenders. Uh, and on another note, climate movements are also very white. Um, and I feel like the role that identity politics can play, it's crucial to recognize that issues of race, class, um, gender, um, and like other intersecting identities are deeply intertwined within um, the environmental justice. Um, and ignoring the intersection not only perpetuates the systemic inequalities, but also undermines the effectiveness and inclusivity of the movement. Um, when you are one of the very few BIPOC in a movement, as I am, sometimes it can be hard to start this kind of conversations because uh, people don't leave themselves what you leave. And sometimes it can be hard to address some issues on your own um, because like the pressure that you live under can be uh, a lot. Um, so like, it's needed that also other people realize how necessary it is to embrace identity politics because it means acknowledging um, the unique experiences and perspective of marginalized communities and also actively working to address like the structural injustices that they, we face. Um, by centering the voices and experiences of the marginalized people, we can create a more robust and inclusive movement that is like uh, better equipped, I will say, um, to face the complex challenges coming from the climate crisis. Uh, but inside a movement, like the protagonism can't exist because if you really want to achieve climate justice, um, if you really want our future to be just and sustainable for everyone, sometimes you need to realize that you have to step aside and leave space to people that in, a, in another context can't take that space. Thank you for that, Denise. Um, yeah, I, I was nodding quite a bit <laughs> because um, I'm glad you brought in this this topic of identity politics. I know we talked a bit about it in our um, previous conversations. Um, but yeah, I mean, the impetus for this series, right, was um, was this context of the climate movement being so white and needing to bring in a more BIPOC perspective um, to the mainstream climate movement. Um, and that is definitely, definitely important. Um, and I also think, in my experience, I feel like we, there's like conflation of identity politics towards everything instead of using it as a tool to understand the politics that we need to be putting forth and the policies that need to be in place. Um, 
And I don't know if you've experienced that. I know what I mean when I say that in terms of like identity politics and how we organize is different than identity politics in what we are fighting for and why. And I think sometimes that gets a little conflated um, because in my opinion, climate justice will require all of us. Liberation will require all of us. But one of the barriers we see as you were talking to, talking about is that some, some people need to do some inner work um, about their positionalities and what that means for how they show up in the movement. It reminds me of one of the organizers I've been spending some time with out here was recruited by Extinction Rebellion to be their Latin American coordinator. And when they told them that if I'm gonna do this, I need to, the perspective that I'm doing this with is what Salam was talking about, the utopia vision of reaching and uplifting the most marginalized. And in this context, Cali is the second largest black community in Latin America. Um, so he was talking about black people and XR was like, oh no, but like, this is for everyone. Like, we're not gonna have that perspective. And so he quit, he doesn't work with them anymore. And I just, I just, I just, I wasn't shocked by that at all, but that is what we're working up against. And I, I feel like too often in the European context, we get, we run into this barrier of people not doing the inner work and then we can't move forward. And right now I see we're at kind of a point of like, all right, well, maybe we can't move forward with everyone and we just need to do some things because we know we need to do them. And I just share that. I don't know if you have any thoughts about that or how that has looked like around you, but if you wanna comment on it, I'm happy to hear. Denise, yeah, you mentioned being one of the few. And so like pushing those conversations forward, deciding how that looks like to overcome some of those barriers is an important part, I think, of how we move our movements forward. Yeah, it, it definitely is. And as I said before, like um, that sometimes people need to realize that they need to step aside. Um, and like when we talk about like the climate crisis, of course, we address a lot of other social issues, issues is that like need to be centered in order like to actually achieve a just climate justice. Um, and like when you are uh, one of the few BIPOC in the movement, as I said before, it can be hard to address certain problems. Uh, but like what needs to be done sometimes uh, as, I mean, at least uh, from my perspective uh, is if you have the strength to keep going, just stay inside these spaces. Cause like, uh, you can be an inspiration for someone else because if someone comes to a space and see that they're not the only one uh, leaving that space, they're not the only biopic in that space, it can be easier. Uh, and sometimes I'm like kind of waiting for other biopic to come and join uh, the movements that uh, I I am part of. Um, and yeah, I, I forgot what I was saying, <laughs> sorry. Um, so yeah, also like for other people, like it it is extremely important to have inclusivity as a core value so that you can create safe spaces so that like people have a space where they can like have discussion about how they feel about um what is not going in in the right direction and they can actually like uh share their vision and like encourage each other when it's needed yeah um you mentioned values um and so i want to talk more about those as well but first i'm curious because salam mentioned how um many people get into the movement thinking about co2 and um I work on a project right now that's that's trying to engage climate philanthropy in particular about how it understands climate justice because what we see so often is a very narrow understanding of climate justice that's really related to like technical environmental issues which are very very important 
But when we're talking about climate justice, if you've been following this series, you know that we're talking more about the social fabric of people and how we build community to be resilient in, in any form against the climate crisis or any other crisis, right? Um, and so I'm thinking about this balance between kind of like the urgency of the climate crisis and the kind of way that we rather want to be organizing when it comes to seeking true, genuine climate justice. And I wonder if either of you, both of you could share a bit about how you frame that balance for yourselves or how you've seen that balance framed in the movements that you're part of. Salam, you wanna start us off this time? Uh, yeah, can, can I just get the question again? Because like I, my someone called me, and I had to like sh shut it on do not disturb. So I <laughs> no got <problem>. disturbed. <laughs> no problem. Um, I was talking about kind of this balance between kind of the urgency of CO two and climatic impacts, which from a climate justice perspective are already happening to many many communities around the world. So like this urgency from a Western global North perspective is rightly criticized. Um, but the balance between that and ha rather how we want to be moving towards climate justice, which incorporates a lot more intersectionality, which requires a bit more time and space to really understand each other. And so, yeah, I was just curious about how you frame that balance for yourself or how you've seen it framed in movements around you. Yeah, so, so I guess, um... I guess one metaphor could be that um, if someone does a crime, if you like throw them in jail, does like criminality disappear? Because it doesn't. And the one person doing bad acts won't stop when they come out. You're not like grabbing the root problem. Um, so if we, let's say, somehow fix, which is impossible, but fix uh, the issue of like climate crisis within like the measurement of CO2 uh, without creating social justice. Have we made a good world? No, we have not. So there's like this sort of like connection between these two and like, uh, then there's like the deeper aspect of we can't fix CO2 going to the atmosphere without, uh, and fixing the um, uh, eco side that is go being committed without like looking at these core fundamental issues within our societies and within, within the world. Um, so 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 it so a way to I guess balance it is to see that like a, a type of a way to balance it is to view fixing social injustice as the way to fix the climate crisis because then you are not splitting them apart you're not giving a bit of focus there and then a bit of focus there um, you 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 are fixing them both at the same time so you're practically being double as effective uh, in some sense. Um, so so I guess when we are talking about um, the climate crisis itself, when we mention how we fix it, when we mention social injustice, we are looking at both and we, we are looking at social injustice as, the, as a thing for itself. Uh, when we fix that, we can look at the effects of it, which is fixing the climate crisis along with fixing i don't know criminality creating better creating better life and lives and all this stuff so it is this sort of like um um like perspective of intersectionality that i don't know that that ceases the need of balance balancing them because they are so connected and then there's uh, the part of like um ensuring that people know that this sort of interconnectedness exists, uh, which is, I guess, um, bound to happen with like educating people and um, making them um, wonder how we fix the, the crisis be uh, and like making them think the like chain reaction through. Um, because it's because only when we've thought it through, we can see it. And like when we have this superficial view of the climate crisis, we are not going anywhere because it's such a um, such a deep rooted issue. All right, so a little bit more visualizing of this chain um, is probably needed. I mean, so we still run into plenty of people who, who maybe don't fully see it yet, um, but a lot of people require more spaciousness to even be able to think and dream and imagine that. 
Um, and that's a real, that's a real thing that I feel like we're dealing with. Yeah. Is that a hand? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, and, and like one thing I love to do with like um, when, when I'm talking with friends or anyone who isn't um, like who hasn't uh, researched or thought it, thought about the climate crisis that much. Um, I like to give them the example of like just purely just um, public transport uh, and like stopping the use of um, like private uh, transportation. And like just showing them the chain effect of that, uh, because like that's a great way of making it really specific, and that helps people visualize uh, the interconnectedness of the crisis by telling them how uh, it's related to uh, like um, fewer um, health issues to use public transport, and how we use less resources, so less um, people will have to make um, like cars which is made under horrible conditions. And like, uh, then we have more space space in the cities uh, for nature. And then we are make the nature makes um, like the cities more cool. They make uh, the air more, um, more healthy, more breathable, uh, which like further helps upon like health issues, uh, which makes more space within the, uh, hospitals to fix other people and then we are letting off stress within doctors and um, and nurses and like just keeping this chain and explaining it further and further um, really helps people um, see it in a way. I really love that example. It really can be expanded to so many different aspects of society, even like economic justice when it comes to, you know, you see cities who have invested in their public transit and everybody uses it like all different classes of people um yeah i really like that example thank you for that denise what what would you like to add to to this kind of idea of balancing or not maybe needing to balance um i feel like um balance can be fine like can the values that a movement gives to itself um like i think about equity for example that is something essential for movements to ensure that the burdens and the benefits of climate actions are distributed in a fair way um and that like the historically marginalized communities are prioritized in the decision making processes um but also like solidarity that is crucial for building uh strong diverse coalitions that can amplify the voices uh of the most affected by climate change uh, uh and challenge the system of power and privilege that perpetuates the injustice while it's extremely important to recognize the value of the, inter the intersectionality too, uh, because it allows us to recognize the interconnectedness of various forms of oppression, discrimination, um, such as race, class, gender, ability, uh, and like seek to address these intersections um, in our strategies for climate justice. And when we center these experiences and this perspective of the marginalized communities, we can develop a more holistic and effective solution uh, that address the root, the real root causes of the environmental injustice. Um, so yeah, and also like another very important value is the inclusivity because it allows people to maybe like be part of a safe space uh and on one side maybe people have to face like very uh hard challenges stuff that make them feel uncomfortable but on the other side if a movement is inclusive uh it can be a community so that people can feel safe and can feel supported by the others um, and if a movement uphold these values um, it can foster a meaningful change and create a more just and sustainable future for all of us nice thank you and thank you for bringing up discomfort as well because um, 
I think that's a really important part of holding safer spaces. And so I'm curious, like, if you could share a bit about what that looked like in practice for you um, to try to create these safer spaces or to hold space for discomfort. Um, I'd be really interested to hear that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, as I said before, supporting each other is very important to help with the discomfort we can sometimes feel. Um, and for example, uh, in FFF Italy, uh, we had some moments where we had these, uh, we all sat in circle and we discussed like eco anxiety. Uh, so sometimes it, it is also relevant to stop doing like organizing stuff, um, and like discuss what is the next section, but it's like stop for a second and focus on ourselves, on our we are doing our our mental health is um so like give a, a lot of space to the emotions uh like create separate moment uh moments and spaces uh for like marginalized communities if needed so that they can discuss between themselves with people that don't invalidate their feelings, maybe not because they want to invalidate them, but also because they wouldn't get them. Uh, and so uh, the support that can come from like the white folks in the movement to for like the BIPOC uh, can be a bit superficial, not because uh, it's what they want to it's like not because they want to give a superficial support but because they just can get like a very uh deep suggestion coming from like a real understanding of what is going on yeah so so to hold space for for that learning to maybe happen in some spaces you know i i i very much agree i think a lot of people in our movements would agree that we do need our own spaces to develop our own perspectives, to, to hear and know that we're not alone in these thoughts that come up when we're organizing in different places and sometimes are the only ones. Um, but to hold that space for discomfort, I see, I find myself arguing for, um, for principled spaces, spaces where everyone is welcome but there are certain principles that hold this space. And if you do something that violates them, we will hold you accountable to that and call people in, allow that to be a learning process rather than a space that would exclude that conversation from coming up at all. Um, yeah, and I think, I, think I, I really value that as part of a stronger movement that we can hold that space and hold each other accountable. Salam, what are you thinking? What sort of, um, values do you want to also add into a stronger movement for climate justice and what does that look like for you in practice? Um, so um, just, so, just so I'm sure when you say values are you meaning like within the movement internally or like externally? Well what do you mean? What, what like, would be the difference for you? Okay so when I uh, think of like values of the movements Internally or externally, at least, there's like the more political aspect of it, where it's like, um, ha what do we agree on? What is like common ground for us as a movement? And um, like, it's really important to have that defined um, within a movement to uh, ensure that everyone is on board with the same thing. And it's uh, important for climate movement to be ambitious within that because we are a movement. We need to fight the impossible. Um, and 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 that are, and that is at least why I'm in a movement uh, because it's ambitious because it like yeah uh, it, uh, because it wants to reach the uh, unreachable of the unreachable um, but and then like internally there's like a, the set of ideals of how we treat each other within the movement how we uh, act with, within each other um, uh, as like comrades and as friends and as um, 
like co-activists in, in in that sense and um there's of course the like uh, more practical stuff of like do not harass each other be be nice and all of that stuff and there's also the part so so we don't like destroy ourselves but there's also like the set of ideals and values within the movement internally that grows us stronger as, as um and like that and that set of ideals could be stuff as like prioritizing the movement um um over like friendships that are being born within the movement when i meet people uh, like let's say i have a friend group within the movement of me me and three others uh, we this when we are at meet meeting so we are when we are at events we don't like only stick to each other but like also open for more people to talk with us and talk to others and like prioritizing the the community of the movement uh, there's also the aspect of um be, being able to be vulnerable together, not to be judged to, um, like the climate crisis is a, a an emotionally heavy crisis uh, as well, and um, it's really strong to be able to um, heal, uh, heal those emotions together and to feel them together, to be able to cry together, um, and to discuss them and, um, like about that, uh, we have one. Uh, activist who is also studying psychology who is um making these sort of like uh, she calls them the i think it was a climate therapy uh, session so something along these lines which are is like this group therapy sessions in some sense um where where we can like just let our like emotionally uh, is our emotional crisis out and uh, be able to heal through that uh, which is really healthy um, and builds us stronger to like not burn out to to be able to sustain ourselves. And uh, speaking of that, uh, there's also the part of like making sure no one gets too stressed out, no one uh, burning out, but uh, while also uh, letting everyone be occupied with the movement if they have the capacity to do something. To do something, uh, yeah. Nice. Thank you so much for that. Um, I love that you both are speaking to and conscious of the need to make space for emotions and for how people are feeling in this work that is very heavy, you know, or can be very heavy. Um, and that is something I think I, I really highlight as the future of the movement, right? Because as we've said, like, Movements for climate justice have been really technical in many senses. Um, I would characterize the mainstream movement as quite like technical focus, like stopping this, okay, this, and that's important. I don't want to say that it's not, but when we're talking about climate justice, we need to make more space for how we all are showing up to these movements. And as you said, being conscious of burnout and being conscious of how we can understand each other and our comrades so that we know who is able to tap in and who needs to tap out for a moment and how we can still keep things going, um, knowing that people are going to need to tap in, tap out. Um, so that's, I think, something really important. I think the fact that you both of your the movements that you are part of or the multiple movements that you both are part of um, make space for that is really important. And it brings me to thinking about how I see that mostly in grassroots movements with community groups who are holding the values of safer spaces, inclusion, emotions. Um, and so I wonder how you both feel about how to maintain that because what I see often is that a lot of what we practice in these more grassroots movements can sometimes be co-opted into a more like NGO setting, institutionalized in a way that then turns these concepts and these ideas like intersectionality or justice even into a buzzword where we're not really seeing them being practiced. And I think that's an important thing to talk about when we talk about the future of the movement, because part of the conversation around addressing the mainstream movement is that a lot of attention, resources, um, and support is going towards these 
bigger movements, these NGOs or institutions who claim to be about justice for, for BIPOC folks, justice for marginalized folks, um, or who claim to be intersectional or feminist when their internal practices are not really there. Do you have any thoughts about what we can do to maintain some of these genuine values um, and what you would say to like the role of those sort of institutions and NGOs as they engage with grassroots organizers? Uh, I guess you what you made me think of instantly is um is an organization I used to be in, which is uh, the Union of Danish Upper Secondary School Students back when I was in upper secondary school, because um, like it was founded on uh, like back in the good old days of the youth rebellion, which was like these huge Danish rebellions we had uh, that uh, like um, that were really radical. Um, and so it it was amazing. It was like this really grassroots type of movement. Um, but like as time passed and now like, what are we, 60 years later, um, the Unif Upper Secondary School students have gotten really institu institutionalized. Um, and so it, 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 it doesn't feel as strong in its uh, policies and its visions and in its um, way of um, in its way of action. Um, it's way more into dialogue with uh, politicians and doesn't um, and, and doesn't go as much on the street. Like in the three years I was in the movement, it there was probably one demonstration total, which, which is like not a lot uh, compared to what it used to be. Um, and um, I think that's like it, it's not that the union is a bad thing it's really great and it has great dialogue with politicians which which can be really positive because then like you have direct like contact with them but that can also um have negative aspects and that has been seen i guess with the um way of compromising with uh, their values in themselves um and i guess one way of um like within the like and to take that perspective into the climate movement could mean that uh, in the climate movement we do want to have dialogues uh, as well as being really really radical and like but but we do but we do also say yes to have a dialogue because that's just healthy um but but um but like we do have to be aware of us not like um being sold of it or by it uh, and like really always remember what we started out with and what we what, what our like ground framework was uh, as our like core values and never give give up on those and always have them as our like um as our like front base base of values in some, in some sense thank you Slap. denise do you have any thoughts that you want to add to this uh, yeah um I feel like that to maintain those values for a grassroots movement and maybe like uh, by answering to this, I will probably also answer to something that I didn't say before uh, when we were talking about like the burnout or like um, protecting mental health of the uh, activists inside the movement. Uh, this aspect is also very important because we need to build communities so that we can help each other to understand better when, um, as we were saying before, to top in and to top out. Um, I think that we as a person are our own priority. And if we don't take ourselves, if, if we don't take care of ourselves first, we can't help the others. So it's important to take care of our physical, emotional, and mental well-being. And it's important to set boundaries, establish like clear boundaries around our activism to prevent overcommitment and burnout. Like learn to say no when necessary and prioritize activities that align with our values and priorities. And if we don't have the same capacity and energy as someone else, it doesn't mean that we are not doing enough because every single little thing 
that we do is important. Um, and connecting with others is extremely important so that we can get an, a supportive community of fellow activists. Um, and we also sometimes need to stop and recharge. So take our time to reflect on our activism journey. Um, what is working well? What isn't? What needs an adjustment? Uh, and recognize when we need uh, to step back, take a break. So pay attention to our energy level, stress, and like emotions so that we can adjust the level of our involvement accordingly. And especially if you are a BIPOC, the pressure you live under can be much bigger. The discomfort that you feel can be much bigger than the one of the white folks. And I feel like this is the starting point for a movement. Because um, like grocery movements, as I mentioned before, should prioritize community ownership and leadership in the decision-making processes uh, and initiatives which involves empowering local communities to define their own priorities, strategies, and solution, rather than like imposing external agendas, I will say. And building strong networks of grassroots organization and activists can help by providing like mutual support and solidarity by collaborating and share resources. The grassroots movements can amplify the impact they have and they can resist the pressure from the mainstream institution better. Um, but also like maintaining transparency and accountability within the grassroots organizations is crucial for ensuring that um, they remain true to their values and goals. Because if you say you are an intersectional movement, you need to act accordingly. You need to be that. Um, and when we talk about like the NGOization of grassroots movements, uh, I feel like um, the established organization can play a very important supportive role by providing resources, resources, uh, expertise, um, even capacity building support to the aggressive grassroots initiatives. Uh, however, it is essential for established organization to recognize the leadership of grassroots movements and avoiding imposing like um, the top down approaches that can then undermine local autonomy and agency of the grassroots movement. Instead, the organization should prioritize partnership and collaboration. They should work in solidarity uh, with the grassroots movements to amplify their voices, to support their efforts. Um, and this might involve like providing technical assistance or um, facilitating networking opportunities. Uh, so uh, yeah, I feel like- <laughs> I think it will look different in so many different contexts, right? Which is comes back to the importance of listening and yeah. asking rather than coming with preset proposals, which I see a lot of the time from more mainstream institution. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, like um, the role of established organization should be to complement and uplift the grassroots action rather than overshadowing or co-opting the movement. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that. Thank you for mentioning roles because that's really where um, my head is at these days and thinking about you know, with my work as well in like the philanthropic world, which we could have a whole nother session on, um, but the role of us, of, of the different institutions and governmental bodies and then the grassroots groups and organizers Knowing our roles and acting accordingly, I think will help us build stronger movements. Um, whether it's a small, smaller grassroots community group or an NGO or whatever it may be. I shared with you, I don't know if you had a chance to look at the social justice ecosystem roles and like the weavers, the disruptors, but like having that consciousness of like the many different roles there are in movements and to be clear about what your role is individually and what your role is as a group, I think will really help us build stronger movements moving forward. 
Um, and ultimately, I think it's important for everyone to recognize that NGOs, institutions will not be the ones to save us. Um, it will be community organizers like yourselves, like all the people that you've heard from this series. Um, we should be, all the resources should be going to them first and foremost. Um, and that brings us into the last part of this conversation as we come to a close, because we're almost almost at the hour. We're gonna go just a little bit over. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking about roles and what all this means for how we move forward. And with this, I want to point to the subtitle of this webinar, which I'm not, I'm not really sure where it came from necessarily, but when I was looking at it this morning, I was like, the next generation of environmental defenders. That is strong wording. If you've heard that term before, environmental defenders, you've probably heard it in a specific context. And Salam point, pointed to it earlier, um, highlighting the reality that environmental defenders is often used for frontline communities, indigenous communities who are consistently murdered for their environmental activism. There's some places like the Philippines who have been at the top of that list for quite some time, um, but environmental defenders are murdered for their activism across the globe in the so-called global South because of extractive capitalistic endeavors most, in most cases. Um, and so to use that in this context of European climate movements, I think is interesting. Um, and so I want to hear from you what you feel like this whole conversation and kind of thinking of yourselves as potentially next generations of environmental defenders. What does that mean for organizers who are sitting in Europe? What does global solidarity look like if we're going to uh, align ourselves with a term like that? Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, okay, so um, by the way, time flies fast. Uh, I didn't realize it was already an hour. Yeah, that's crazy. Um, and I just looked up the the number of people, and it's three people a week, uh, according to the UN, which is a lot. Um, like that 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 would have killed my movement in um, like in half a year, <laughs> maybe maybe a bit more. Um, but 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 the thing is, it's such a huge issue. Um, and um, but the, like the term environmental defender, I, I it's not a term that I have looked that much into uh, because I've just been calling myself a climate justice activist because I do activism and I do it for climate justice, and so it just made sense for me. And I guess it's a term that I have to to research a bit more for myself and to hear from people who define themselves as climate defenders to hear them define the word word and as what it is. And like, but and I can say that in Instinctively, it sounds um, like more right for people who are in a more affected places, um, because because when you're a defender, you're like a bit more in there uh, where where the trouble is, where where the crisis is, I guess. Um, and, and and so I guess environmental defenders is uh, may, might be like um, a, 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 a like a, a key like a key type of. Uh, people to 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 fix a, a climate crisis because it's it's the ones who who are affected by it the most, um, uh, the one trying to do some something about it and not and the one who are at risk. Um, while like my uh, activism is is um, is secured behind the privileges of um, of of my global north um, placement here um, and. Um, though it's really safe for me to do activism here and I'm not at risk or anything, um, there have been increased um, inf law enforcement against climate activism. And it's seen in uh, in in the UK, it's seen in, I think it was France or something. I don't really remember. Uh, but like so, some 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 places around the global north and in Europe and stuff, there has been there have been increased cases of uh, police and of stuff like that going uh, a bit more. Uh, like um, aggressive to it in some sense, um, yeah. Uh, and I think that's one thing that will increase, especially here in Europe, in the um, in the next years. 
it's something that I fear will increase in the next years. Uh, and I think that as um as I guess the um anti climate activists uh, become more well. You you cut out for a moment for me. I don't know when you said. Uh oh, Salah might be might be frozen. Yeah. <laughs> you want to pick us up for a moment while Salam reconnect? Oh sure. Okay, I'll go. Um, so as Salam said before, when I think of climate defenders, I mainly. I, I don't picture myself as a climate defender. Uh, I picture the frontline activists as climate defenders. And I think they play a crucial role in the fight for climate justice on several fronts. Um, like they raise awareness about the disproportionate impacts of climate change on vulnerable communities, such as low-income communities, indigenous people, um, communities of colors. Um, uh, of color, sorry. Um, and climate defenders often highlight and, ch and challenge environmental injustice, such as the siting of polluting industry in marginalized communities, regions, or the unequal distribution of environmental arms and benefits. Um, mm -hmm. The frontline communities engage in direct action and resistance and resilience to disrupt environmentally harmful activities such as fossil fossil fuel extraction, deforestation, um, or destructive infrastructure projects on their land. So these are all activities done by the global north that destroy the homes and the land of people living in the global south. So what we should do is to recognize the importance of the work that the climate defenders do and recognize that if they don't have any other choice, because I don't feel like they woke up one day saying, I need to defend my territory, but it's like um, what they need to do in order to survive because their land is being destroyed every day um so we need to recognize that we also have a role in that that it's our fault as the global north uh so supporting them amplify the voices and fights is the least we can do and i feel like by looking at what they do we can find inspiration and focus for building stronger movements for climate justice uh by looking at their uh, resilience and solidarity and so it's essential to center the the, the marginalized voices uh is centered is central to recognize the interconnectedness of social economic uh environmental justice issues um, mm -hmm. and we should build um a diverse inclusive coalition that bridge movements and sectors by working in solidarity across like identities and struggles, we can amplify our collective power and address the root causes of injustice. And yes. we must advocate for a just transition that prioritize for real the needs of workers, which includes in investing um, in job creation, um, or, or training programs and social safety nets so that we can ensure a fair and equitable transition for everyone. And like climate justice is a global issue which requires a global solidarity. Um, and by connecting with movements and allies around the world, I feel like that by sharing resources and strategies uh, and by advocating for international cooperation, we can build a more just and sustainable future. Um, and moving forward, I feel it's essential to maintain a sense of urgency and determination while also, of course, self-care, uh, solidarity and long vision term. It's extremely important to stand in solidarity with grassroots movement in the global south, support their leadership in the fight for climate justice. Uh, and that's like, uh, it, this recognizement 
plays a key role. And we need to acknowledge Europe's historical role in colonialism and environmental exploitation and work to dismantle like the system of oppression that perpetuates the inequalities um, and like and the environmental degradation. Um, so uh, yeah, we need to prioritize the needs of marginalized communities in the global south, including debt relief, fair trade, and reparations for um, for climate related damages. Thank you so much, Denise. You're already getting into kind of calls for action that I wanted to close with. Um, and so as we come, to, no, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. So as we come to a close, I think one last point I want to make is we've, we've talked in the series about like the terminology of global north, global south, and how um, in reality there are global souths within the global north as well. And so like it's not, it does not work to have a blanket understanding of what marginalized means because marginalized means different things in many different contexts, which requires us to have these honest conversations about where we're at and what we're doing and why we're doing it. And so what you say about being in solidarity globally um, and uplifting certain voices is very, very true. Um, but in some of our previous conversations, I also shared with you my, my thoughts around allies versus accomplices accomplices. Um, and I don't know if you've heard this, those who are listening have heard that kind of distinction before, but I've been thinking about it a lot in what we're seeing right now. This, this entire series has launched and is now concluding with in the last six months where we've seen a resurgence of attention on Palestine, rightly, because the genocide has not stopped. It is not stopping. And while we began rightly with protests and demos to show that we are not okay with it, what we have seen is that our governments and institutions will not save us. They have no interest in actually changing systems that will ultimately lead us to climate justice and a more just world. And in this very moment, I can't help but be extremely inspired um, and hopeful, even though I, I don't really like being hopeful, I like just doing things. Um, but I'm hopeful watching the student uprisings in the United States because they are blossoming everywhere on campuses. Um, I have not yet seen the same intensity in the European context, and I wonder if it will jump across the ocean as such. Um, I'd love to see that. I, I think these movements and these student uprisings are incredibly important. And I also wish to see more understanding of the, the idea of an accomplice in this situation. We're talking a lot about liberation for Palestine, but what does liberation for Palestine mean for the liberation of our communities as well? Because if we deal with what's in our backyard, can we ultimately stop some of a lot of the perpetuation of injustices that go outside, right? And that's that's the conversation I feel like we need to be nurturing more of as we continue being loud for Palestine or any other genocide that's happening in the world, whether it be Sudan or Congo or Tigray, because those things are still going on as well. Um, and so to be an ally in a European global uh, in a European movement for climate justice or an accomplice even better um, requires us to really understand these interconnected issues and how we can stop them in our own backyard so that we can be in genuine solidarity with those out there. And so that's something to really unpack. We don't have time to unpack it at the moment, but my wish for anyone listening still to this series is to reach out to organizers that you've heard here to build these strong communities of people who are thinking about these things in your own neighborhoods and to continue doing this work that's underlying the loudness of being out of the demo or having some encampment that's very needed. But the conversations that are happening in between that are what are, are what is going to save us. At least that's my thought. And so with that, <laughs> I'd love to hear one last word from both of you about any calls to action you have or any anything that you feel like needs to be focused on um, as we continue building stronger movements for climate justice. 
Um, Salam, we can start with you. Yeah. Um, well, a really big inspiration for me, at least, and and my personal call to action is that um, most of the people in Palestine, the people displaced by ECOP, all of these people who are in affected um, affected areas, especially in the global south, either by um, imperialism, climate crisis, and all the uh, other uh, issues in in our world uh, inflicted by the global north. Um, they are not the ones uh, who are the most able to speak out. Um, either they'll get killed or harassed, or if they don't have um, the the means necessary to to speak out. Uh, meanwhile, we are privileged enough either not to care, which is a bit sad, or we are privileged enough to care and to do something about it and to go out on the streets and try to demand um uh, better conditions for everyone and we are the ones um in the countries responsible for what what like the horrible stuff going on in the rest of the world so i guess um i guess we we as people in the global north um for me at least um i was like have the responsibility um as we have the privilege to go out of the streets to uh, try to do something about it so um like uh, yeah i i guess i can't imagine myself not doing activism because it 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 brings meaning for, for me in my life and um and and i do have the privilege to do so um so yeah power to you salam thank you denise any last additions uh yeah um i feel like sometimes even friends ask me like what my call to action will be um and it's always like a tough question because i do this stuff like automatically and it's kind of hard to stop and like start to think about something to say um but i will say like join or support local community ju um justice climate justice uh initiatives uh get involved with grassroots uh, movement organization working on climate justice in your community uh whether it's like participating in protests or volunteering for like local projects or supporting campaigns every like little contribution can make a difference um then always like advocate for policy changes uh demand accountability from governments from people in power uh divest from like fossil fuels boycott the most polluting companies because like divestment sends very powerful political messages uh, and very powerful signal to the industry and contributes to the transition towards a more sustainable future um but also it's very important to never stop sharing information about climate justice issues with friends family and communities it's something that we always need to talk about and especially we need to talk about the intersectionality of our fight so all the social aspects that the climate crisis touches um and more importantly always support and stand in solidarity with the frontline communities um and as we said before with the global south living in the global north so not only like indigenous people but also like uh we also have indigenous people in the global north of course uh but also people of color and low-income communities or individuals listen to their stories amplify their voices when you can um support their efforts for justice and their resi their their resilience um, I feel like um, sometimes this capitalistic system shapes our life that much that we forget that we have the right to envision and advocate for a just and sustainable future where everyone has access to clean air, water, land, where all communities can thrive uh, in harmony with nature, where no one is exploited, where um, no territory is occupied. So maybe just stop for a second and use your creativity, passion and determination to work towards this vision every day, little by little. And together, I feel like we can build a powerful movement for climate justice that transforms 
our world for the better, because every action, no matter how small, contributes to the collective effort to create a more just and sustainable future for everyone. Thank you so much, Sinead. <laughs> I see clapping from Salam as well. All right, we do have to close, sadly. Of course, these conversations could go on and on and on. So I just want to say thank you so much to both of you, Denise Salam, for joining us for this last episode of Reframing Climate Justice. A special, special thank you to Deborah and Estefania for staying with us and translating, interpreting this conversation. Um, and power to the people. Thank you so much. Have a beautiful Thank rest. you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye. Bye.